Okay, so uh, I left Google in March, and uh, I had some plans for what I was going to uh, uh, work on during this between the, during the summer. I decided I decided not to take another job, um, and. On the day I left Google, I ran across some interesting uh, crypto-related technology that got me all excited. And uh, n not according to my plans, I've spent the whole time between then and now working on privacy and cryptography and secrecy and identity and so on. And I've been having so much fun. Um, and now, you know, summer's over. I'm starting to think about uh, getting another job. So I'm, I'm trying to find somebody who will pay me for doing the stuff I'm going to talk to you about. So uh, last week in Copenhagen was the first time I ever talked about this stuff I've been working on. So you're getting a slightly, you're getting the, the version after one rehearsal. So probably it'll be a little bit more polished. And uh, this includes code that was checked in last week. So this is, you know, fresh news here. Okay. Um, I'm going to be visiting a few pages as the talk goes on. Um, I've got a couple of links there, and I'm giving them a PDF of the talk as soon as it's over. And if you want to write this down, you can come and get it from me after the talk. Or if you write really fast, you can get it now. So we are software developers, which means that by definition, we write code that stores and manages other people's information. And I'd say that those people are relying on us to you know, take good care of it. That is more so than it used to be. For a long time, it didn't occur to most people to worry about you know, people sneaking, s sneaking around and looking at their data that they didn't want. But over the last few years, well, we've had you know, an endless sequence of privacy problems and credit card hacks and social media leakage and various bad things happening to the extent that people have started to become aware of this problem. And then, of course, we've had Mr. Snowden. And to be honest, you know, there are a lot of conversations we are having now that we would not be having if Mr. Snowden had not been courageous and decided to go one-on-one -on -one against the government of, of the USA. So my claim is that a whole lot of ordinary people have realized that the internet is a dangerous place and their information is hanging around in a bad neighborhood. Used to be security was something that nobody ever thought about until you screwed up, of course, then you got fired. Sort of like your basic sysadmin work, right? When you do your job perfectly, nobody notices. But um, th the times have changed. I mean, we've always had an ethical imperative to take good care of other people's information, but I think we're actually starting to have a business Im imperative. People are actually seeing you know, good security and privacy practices as a business level marketing win. And as an example of that, I give you the news two weeks ago that Apple announced that they can no longer open up other people's phones. And they trumpeted that to the skies, and there's been big positive and negative reactions all over the industry. And you know, whatever you think about Apple, Apple really knows a lot about marketing. So, you know, if Apple thinks that this is a good thing to be highlighting in their marketing, I think that we should probably have some respect for, for that opinion. Um, so, it's now, if we agree that it's a business imperative to, to protect people's information against those who would scoop it up and use it for purposes we don't approve of, well, who are those people? Well, to start with, of course, there are the crooks, the criminals, the really bad people. And I love the, you know, the cheerful illegality of this page. They, they have a, an English version, too, but um, the ru it somehow it looks more evil in Russian. Um, <laughs> what they do is they sell accounts, uh, fake accounts. And you know, they give you the numbers that are for sale from all these different uh, operators. And uh, boy, are the pixels ever big and fat on that slide. Wow. Um, the numbers that are for sale and the price per thousand. And of course, you can judge the relative quality of the security organizations by looking at this and seeing how many stolen accounts are for sale and what the price is. You know, the fewer the better, the higher the better, respectively. And um, I encourage you to do that. It's fun. Um, so, but of course, a lot of the people who are trying to steal your information and the information of your customers are not necessarily bad people. They're just misguided, shall we say, um, overeager. You know, they are mostly honest people that are convinced they're protecting their citizens from all those horrible terrorists that are out there. Now, probably a majority of the people in this room and at this conference live in places where the government is reasonably civilized, and you don't really have to worry that they will come to your place in the night and knock the door down and take you away to a camp. But Whereas that's probably true at this conference, it is not true in the world at large. 
a very high proportion of people live in a, a, a places where if you have you know, the wrong opinions, keeping them private can be a matter of life or death. And by definition, since the internet is a offered on a global scale, some proportion of the people who use your software are living in places where government is not the friend. And, you know, it's important to realize that it's not really useful. It's not, it, it's a waste of time to worry about why people are trying to get at your user's data. Whether it's the crook, crooks or whether it's the government agents, that's not really your business. And it's not your job to understand them and anyhow you can't because they never say anything about what they're doing. Um, and so your job is just to protect the information. So let's just ignore for a moment why the people are after the information and worry about protecting it. But Actually, maybe we don't have to worry, because maybe if you're not doing anything wrong, why do you need privacy? As Eric Schmidt famously said in 2009. Now, you know, to be fair to Eric, I bet you if you asked him about that today, he might fine-tune his answer a little bit, given some of the issues that, that, that Google's been having. So, but I, I find that when I'm actually talking about privacy and security among ordinary people who aren't geeks, I get this all the time. Well, what do you need secrecy for? You have secrets? Um, and that's just bullshit. It's a really stupid argument. But sometimes in the middle of the discussion, it's hard to remember why that's, that's a bad argument. So I'm going to run through five reasons why that's a really stupid thing to say. Um, so first of all, the, number, the people who are working for the national security agencies are just people which means most of them are ordinary, honorable, decent, underpaid people who are working hard and trying to you know, protect you. On the other hand, a small proportion of any group of people are psychopaths or crooked or stupid or just mean, mean people. Um, I mean, in the United States security establishment, we know, don't know for sure, but there's estimated that there's maybe 100,000 people, 200,000 people. So even if only like 5% of them are bad people, it's a pretty scary number you get. And those people with the power of the state behind them have, are in a position to like really screw up your life. So we need to respect our public employees who are doing this kind of stuff, but we also need to control them and make sure that if they have silly ideas that they should scoop up all the information, we should n not facilitate that. Um, the second problem is that unfortunately, it is true that law enforcement people always, it seems, develop a sort of a tribal culture of us and them. I, I, I'm sure some of you know policemen and they're perfectly nice people, but you know, they have this attitude. There's the tribe of us and there's the tribe of the bad people out there. And this can easily get out of control. And especially, you know, the us against them mentality can get to the situation where it, uh, they suddenly do something like in Thailand and the police force and the army is suddenly the government. Okay, that's probably not going to happen in Denmark or in Canada, but there I guarantee you have some customers in places where that could happen. And for those people, the things that they could say today could become fatal tomorrow if they do not have privacy applied appropriately. So we have to, you know, just watch out for this tribal tendency. The other prob another problem, item, th item three is, that the government organizations want to put back doors in our routers and in our data centers and in our trunks and in our Wi-Fi networks and so on. And at the end of the day, there is no such thing as a one-way back door. And the bad guys, the really bad guys, know that the governments are trying to put back doors in and they're looking for those back doors and they're finding them. So it's just really bad and unprofessional to, to be doing that and they're doing it and it's infuriating and they should stop. The, other th th the fourth big problem with uh, the national security establishment is the amount of money going into it, which is totally absurd. If you look at the you know, actual number of bad things and deaths that are caused by terrorism and compare it to things like texting while driving or problems with early childhood education and compare the amount of money being spent on that and the amount of money sp spent on this, it's ludicrous. It's a ludicrous waste of money. It's non-cost effective, even if it were uh, well intended, which in many cases it's not. Um, finally, the most important point, and this is really the most important point about privacy, that's a picture of somebody's front door which is closed. We are fortunate people. We have the gift of being members of a civilization which we and our ancestors have built. And being in a civilization means you don't have to go and get water from the creek, you don't have to go and shit in a ditch, you live in a house with thick walls and a front door that you can close, and once the door is closed, you can do whatever you want behind it. Privacy is not good because it enables certain things. Privacy is good. 
Privacy lets us sleep better at night. It makes us happier people. It is a basic reward of being a member of a civilization. And any organization that is trying to take that basic benefit of civilization away from you, you should be proud to be fighting back. It's part of what we've earned by building civilizations, and we should protect it. Well, that's what I think, anyhow. So, so there, there are some, some arguments to push back against when you hear this crap about, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, why do you need privacy? Um, fortunately, I'm not entirely alone. In May of this year, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the organization that builds the internet, builds all the internet protocols, adopted this document. And it, it's, its message is very clear, and it's right there in the abstract, which says that all these people trying to spy on the internet from an engineering point of view, should be considered as attackers. We don't care why they're trying to do it, they're attackers, that's all they are. And they now have a principle in the IETF that no new internet protocols can be designed if they do not include countermeasures for this kind of attack. Now, one of the interesting things about that, this, is that even though the Snowden story broke in June of 2013, this was only adopted in May of 2014. It, they thought about this and argued about it and worked it over for 11 months. And if you read the document, it's got a, a very balanced consideration of the issues. So this was not a, a, a hasty, rushed statement. This is a careful statement by the people who are building the Internet of the future. And I think we should salute them and I think we should help them and be on their side. So let's assume we all agree that, um, all right, um, so let's assume that we all agree that we'd like to increase privacy, and increase security, and that kind of thing. So unfortunately, a lot of software developers don't want to go near this stuff, because it has two big problems. Two things we really don't like to deal with. One is really hard math, and the second is politics. Okay, so I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that you don't have to deal with the really hard math. That's all in libraries. The libraries are pretty high quality. You can just use them and, and, and they'll do the right thing. The politics, unfortunately, politics is part of reality. You can't go away. And very many software people go, oh, politics, that's icky stuff. I, you know, I, I don't want to do that stuff. Well, I'm sorry. You know, If you walk away and decline to do politics, you have abandon the right to complain when the politics turn out in a way you don't like. Once again, as a consequence of being in a civilization, we have the right to shout at our lawmakers when they're going to adopt stupid privacy policies and tell them, no, that's wrong. And if we are not sufficiently persuasive, we can try and get rid of them and get better lawmakers. So, you know, I, I encourage everybody to, to do that. Uh, unpleasant, though many of us find it. And actually, you know, politics, many people find is kind of fun once you get into it. So, Let's agree that we're going to try and increase the privacy level. Let's give us some, so let, me, let me start by giving us some, some terms to talk in terms of, here's how I think of privacy these days. So basic privacy means that, you know, I can use uh, my laptop in a cafe or in my office and I don't have to worry that somebody's, you know, hacked the Wi-Fi and I don't have to worry too much that somebody's hacked the router and I don't have to worry that the sites I'm talking to are using plain text so anybody can, can just spy on it. And, you know, this is the kind of thing you get with a de competent deployment and using HTTPS. So that's basically, this is the kind of thing that if we're not offering our users, we're failing in our professional responsibilities. Common privacy is what we sort of think of that we have in civilized societies, which is that information that is known to be ours can't be shown to other people without our consent. Well, unless there are certain judicial processes. You know, if, if the police become convinced that I am smuggling bombs or child pornography or plotting to kill my boss or something like that, then yeah, they will go get a the judge, they'll get a search warrant, they'll come to my house and search my house, they'll, open, they'll go to Google and say, here's the search warrant, show us the mail, they'll get the mail. And I think most of us are sort of okay with that in civilized societies. You know, you have to have judicial processes for investigating and preventing crimes. However, there are two problems. One is, as I pointed out, a substantial proportion of humanity do not live in countries where they have that kind of, you know, uh, you know, civilized process and the police just go and look wherever they want without asking permission. And secondly, as Ed Snowden proved, the government organizations have gone off the rails and have adopted the position that we have the right to have everybody's information about everything, just trust us. No, I don't. So maybe common privacy, which should be good enough in a civilized society, isn't good enough. So strong privacy is, is a higher level. Strong privacy is where, you know, you can be really sure that nobody ever sees your information, not your government, not your email provider, not your ESP, just you, where everything's uh, encrypted all the time. And let's talk about how we might get there. Um, 
to start with, we have some best practices that we can start to inc include. And I, I feel embarrassed almost in 2014 that I still have to come to conferences and say, use HTTPS. You know, I used to ask for a show of hands how many people are using HTTPS all the time and how many aren't, but I didn't believe them. I think people were lying, you know, so there were hands going up. Um, so if you're not using HTTPS, go back after you get home to the conference, go to your office and make an appointment with your legal people, with the company lawyers. And you go to the company lawyers and you say, oh, by the way, we're operating in a mode where anybody can spy on what our users are doing. I just wanted to get legal approval that it's okay for us to do that. <laughs> you might get a surprise. Um, there, there's, you know, I'm horrified. I go to big university websites and I put HTTPS in front of the URL and it breaks. You know, the website breaks. I go, I go to my kids' schools and go into the computer lab, and they're running all these educational applications in plain text. Some bad guy could be sitting in his car in the parking lot outside the school running a Wi-Fi sniffer, and he's going to find out all sorts of things about all the kids in that school. I'm beginning to think that there are going to be some huge, catastrophic legal cases where ordinary people app builders get in trouble because they were falling down on their basic responsibility to run an encrypted mode. But, you know, I hear people saying, well, you know, my stuff is just public brochureware. Why would I want to encrypt it? Or, you know, I, uh, people should have choices. Why should I impose encryption on people? Or, you know, it costs money to, to, run, to get a cert and, you know, turn HTTPS on. Well, bullshit. I mean, that's just, that, that, that's just not an acceptable argument in 2014. Um, and... and Failure modes are asymmetric. You know, providing secrecy when you didn't need it means, well, I spent a little extra money. Not providing secrecy when they needed it, maybe I just... I mean, Wikipedia these days. Wikipedia is offered by default in HTTPS. Is that insane? No, of course it's not insane. Suppose you're, you know, a gay man in Uganda who is worried about catching only a sexually transmitted disease. You know, if somebody catches you on Wikipedia looking that up, uh, you could find yourself with your life ruined. Wikipedia should be off, off, operating only in HTTPS. And it's really hard to make the decision. When is privacy appropriate? It's incredibly contextual. You know, somebody in a cafe in Aarhus, you know, looking up you know, information about sexually transmitted diseases is not taking any risks. So, you know, whether or not privacy appro is appropriate is a very complex and difficult decision based on where you are, who you are, what you're doing, when you're doing it, who's around you. And it's easy to get the decision wrong, so just don't take the decision. Why should you ask people to make these complex, high, important life decisions when the chances of getting it right aren't so good? Just run everything in a private mode, encrypted all the time, and you've done away with all those problems. Why wouldn't you do that? And, you know, don't complain to me about the cost of HTTPS. You can get a single domain cert for less than $10 a year. You can get a wildcard cert for under $100 a year. If you have enough money to get a domain name, and spin up an EC2 instance, you bloody well have enough money to get a certain start running HTTPS. So, so just start doing that. Okay, I'm sorry, I get a little upset about that because there's still too many people not doing that. Um, there's one pushback against this that I hear that's actually a little bit subtle and dangerous. And this one is actually from people who are real, actual real security experts who actually understand HTTPS and... Um, uh, and uh, uh, how easy it is to get it wrong and things like that, and they're familiar with the shortcomings. Now, in fact, there's some truth in what they say. HTTPS is flawed in the sense that there are a lot of different ways you can screw up the deployment. So even though you have it, you know, there's easy trapdoors and people can get around it. Um, they are also right that the certificate authority business is totally screwed up and awful and corrupt and disorganized and, and, and just generally bad. Um, they're wrong about the NSA. The NSA has not actually cracked HTTPS. Um, ask Ed Snowden. Ed Snowden, you know, made it very clearly. Yeah, no, they can't crack the crypto. They crack the endpoints. So, you know, w w worry about the endpoints. Um, and then the last point is actually pretty good. What it says that, you know, you shouldn't promise people absolute security because you're not really offering absolute security. You know, there, there, there's no such thing as absolute privacy. Somebody can always get through. If you want to really uh, be comprehensively educated about how easy it is to break security, there's this great, this guy's from New Zealand, and um, it's a, like a huge uh, slide presentation about all the many, many, many different ways you can screw up your security and, and leave the gate open for bad guys to get in. And actually, I encourage you to, to read it because it's educational and it's depressing, but it's also kind of funny um, about you know, all the different ways you can screw up your crypto. 
Another good one is this guy from Microsoft, who I, I, I love his column. He, he writes a column regularly. I think he finally stopped. It's a pity. Um, and he points out that when you're thinking about privacy, you also think about the, uh, the adversary. And he used the Israeli Mossad as an example. And he says, you know, if the Mossad thinks you're plotting to blow up Jerusalem, crypto isn't going to help you, right? They, they, you know, if everything else, they will sneak into your office and put a camera where it can watch your keyboard and your screen all the time. And then, you know, all the crypto in the world isn't going to help you. And so you come back to the question, well, we at can't actually you know, be provide real safe safety, so should we be claiming to be safe at all? And I think this is a symptom of, 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 a, of the wrong way of thinking about it. At the end of the day, um, privacy is a matter of economics. You know, we have a saying in, in English, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And it's really wrong to think of security as a switch, on and off. Security is a dial. And every time you turn the dial up, you, every time you increase the proportion of the traffic that is encrypted, every time you, know, you adopt two-factor authentication, every time you reduce the attack surface, you change the security economics. The only reason that the NSA can scan everything is because it's been being transmitted in plain text and the cost of processing each unit is essentially zero. The only way those guys that buy access and get all those email addresses is because there's all this stuff going back and forth in plain text. There's so much stuff on the internet that if you can increase the cost of processing one little bit of intercepted to any non-zero amount, nobody can afford it. Nobody can afford any amount times the amount of stuff on the internet. So every time you deploy privacy technologies, you increase the cost of certain kinds of criminal activity and certain kinds of government surveillance activity, and they become economic, and people stop doing them, and we improve the internet. So what we should be doing is, you know, for those of us who've worked in system optimization, trying to make applications run faster, you learn that all you can ever do is move the bottleneck around, right? You find what's going slow, you fix that, and then everything runs faster, but you find what else is going slow. It's the same way with privacy. You find, oh, where in my, in my system is privacy leaking? Let's fix that. And then what else is my next weak spot? So let's go and fix that uh, incrementally. Um, so... Let's do that. Let's just systematically go about uh, increasing the privacy of the world. So if you're going to use HTTPS, I have a couple of good practices that are starting to become apparent that you should think about applying. One is um, everybody should stop using SHA-1. Um, this is what actually comes by default with many of the certs that you get. And it's not been broken, but there are mathematical attacks known so that you can crack this using an amount of resources on Amazon EC2 that would cost about 2 to $4 million. So if it costs two to four million this year, it's going to be one to two million next year, and you know, work it out. Now, fortunately, this is not so hard. Um, you move to SHA-2, it's easy. This particular blog piece has instructions on how to do it. Uh, virtually all the infrastructure and hosting providers and so on are set up to just work, so you just go ahead and do it. And anyhow, you have to do this. You don't have any choice because starting next year, Google will start going to put little question marks beside the lock in your HTTPS if you're in your browser if you're still using SHA-1. So, so you really need to get on this one. The other one that I'm starting to hear a lot of noise about, and it's a little subtler, is the notion of pinning certs. Um, and here's an example source code that I wrote not too long ago to retrieve some stuff from Keybase. And it's you know, very classic HTTP stuff. So I open a connection to HTTPS keybase.io and I make a query and I go and do some restful stuff against it. You know, that's from an Android app. I'm sure that a very high proportion of the people in the room have Android apps. And I'm sure that nearly 100% nearly of your Android apps have code just like that inside them. So the clue if you look at that is that the actual host name is wired directly into the source code. And that's, an ex that, that's a, a good example, uh, that's a good reason to think, wait a second, there's, there's an obvious weakness there. So to actually execute that statement, what it's going to do is it's going to go to the DNS to find uh, keybase.io, and then it's going to uh, go and get the cert and check it against a bunch of uh, basically all the cert authorities in the world. You know, it, it'll, it'll see what the cert says, and it'll go and ask that cert authority, and it'll decide to believe it or not. And first of all, the DNS isn't 100% bulletproof, and secondly, the cert business is totally not 100% bulletproof. And there's a way you can get around that, which is to say that the certs that keybase.io offers uh, are well known. 
and they're based on a private key that only keybase.io has. And rather than do it this way, you can actually say, no, no, don't bother checking the DNS, don't bother checking the cert. I, I know the public key that they use, so I'm just going to hardwire my, my application code directly to that. And here's a terrific blog entry by Moxie Marlinspike, who's one of the, the best security researchers, uh, giving you exact details for how to do that. And in particular, in your mobile apps, where you know, people aren't typing in URLs, the URL is wired right into the app. Why would you go through? Now, I haven't actually researched this, but my intuition is that this might also improve performance, right? Because you're, you're uh, not doing the cert uh, chaining trick and that kind of stick. You're, you're just checking against a particular hardwired public key, although, although I haven't checked that. Now, there's, you can go all the way and link directly to the uh, public key of the person who's offering it. Maybe that's a little too extreme for you. The other thing you can do is you can go and most, most sites will say, okay, our cert comes from this particular certificate authority. And you can also uh, set up your app so that you only accept their cert if it comes from that cert authority or one or two others. Both of these things are better than the current way of doing it. And um, check them out. Also, if you are offering a... Uh, a, uh, a, a, an API that is addressed somewhat in this style, uh, you should consider publishing your, your, your cert and your public keys so that people can do this and pin their clients to your server. So, so think about that. It's, it's a good idea. Okay. Um, and speaking of removing classes of problems, um, I'm going to say a few words about two-factor. Um, most people who are in this room, I hope, are already using two-factor for your Google and Microsoft and Steam and so on accounts. Um, you, you, you guys are like the doctors in the Ebola hospital. You need to be really especially careful that you don't get it because if you get it, you're apt to be passing it on to, to innocent people. So please, everybody in the business, start using two-factor right now. Now, if you haven't used two-factor, the, the way it works is sometimes when you log in, along with um, your password, it will send you an SMS and say, you know, type in this code. But don't do that. If you're actually using two-factor, it's a much better practice to go, and if you're using Google, for example, get the Google Authenticator app, and uh, it just, it's on your mobile, and it just gives you the number, and, and you type in the number, and you get in that way, and it doesn't depend on SMS connectivity, and it doesn't give money to the evil telephone companies for, you know, handling millions of SMSs. And also, it turns out that the, this thing, its interfaces are documented, and if you might want to consider offering two-factor authentication for your own app, and you can actually do that using Google Authenticator. It's not trivial, but it's, it's not rocket science either. It's not that hard to figure. It runs on iPhone and iOS and Windows Phone right now today. So, so, so think about doing that. The other thing is, is that Google Authenticator is also a, uh, an open source app. So you could make your, you know, if, if you are, uh, you know, a truck company or something like that, you could make your own branded, private branded authenticator app and give it to people who want to uh, authenticate to you, and it would work just fine. And, you know, you may have noticed that no matter how great your password is, um, any bank in the world will give you money for a piece of plastic and four digits. You know, the, the basic security model around two-factor authentication is just better than for any single factor. So, so, so this is something that, that's really worth uh, good attention. Oh, sorry, I'm, there's the actual Google Authenticator code. Right. So another model of two-factor authentication that you might want to think about is um, something like this, which is, is a YubiKey uh, uh, thing, and it's an interesting device. It's got um, a USB and an NFC on it, um, so it will do. It will actually create key pairs. It'll do what's the name of that protocol? T O T H, something like that, uh, for for assisted login. So it's another effective two-factor thing. This one model actually has a pin you type in. You can get another model that sits permanently in the USB slot, and you just tap it to say, "Yeah, I'm a real human, and I'm here." And they both, and it also it can be used with mobile devices. You just pull it to the back of your mobile device, and you can do things like with LastPass, you can get in through your th to the password manager through it. It's, it's actually a nice model. Oops, I'm. Sorry getting behind on my slides. Uh, there's that product. But there's actually an organization called FIDO that is trying to develop a standard for these things. At the moment, these are a little expensive. This thing is 50 bucks, and that's quite expensive. But if you were using it for a, a wide range of apps, that might be you know, an acceptable cost. And furthermore, as we get into industrial production, I'm sure the cost will, will come down on these things. OK, so there are some very, what's my time? What time do I'm supposed to stop? 30 minutes? You're kidding. 25, I think. Oh, okay. Anyhow. Wow, we're going to have time to talk. I've been going too fast. Okay. Um, 
So I should have said, since this audience is small, um, you know, we can make this interactive. And, and does anybody want to, I'm about to shift gears and talk about something else. Does anybody want to ask questions or object or disagree with anything I've said so far? No? Cool. Yeah. Um, in the, you, you talk about cert pinning. Yeah. Um, what are the best practices around key rotation, especially like Heartbleed? Well, see, the, the problem, yeah, that's the thing, is that, you know, cert pinning, the, the real risk is if you, if you um, bind it to a private key, the risk is the private key gets compromised. And until Heartbleed, everybody thought that was a very low risk. Um, and um, it's obviously a non-zero risk. Now, if that happened, then that means you need to update all the mobile apps, which is, I was talking about in my keynote, can be a little bit painful. Um, having said that, you know, you have to do your own security. And are you more worried about breakage in the cert, in the CA system, or are you more worried about having your private key compromised? I think, you know, people who are running, you know, well done web facing things, I would probably be, be more worried about CA breakage than about, you know, having my private key stolen. But, you know, you're going to have to do that analysis for yourself. That's why Moxie Marlin Spike said, well, if this scares you, which it does scare some people, instead of that, just go and restrict the number of certs you'll accept, you know, say that I know that keybase.io cert comes from this one particular CA, and I'm just not going to take their cert unless it, com unless it comes from that CA. Um, and that's a, you know, a useful intermediate step. There was a hand up. Yeah, so I don't have a question, but I, I wanted to go back to HTTPS for a second. I felt like you were not strong enough about your encouragement. And the reason for that is uh, not only about protecting the information that is being sent, it's also been revealed that it's very, very easy to attack people using injection attacks if you don't use HTTPS. So HTTPS not, uh, is not only about the security of the communication, right. but also about the integrity of the communication. And that's one of the ways that the NSA and other agencies are using for wide-scale automated uh, uh, mass right. surveillance and mass attack. Right. And it's possible to get zero dollars se search quite easily. You know what? Actually, I don't believe that. I, I, the zero dollar certs, first of all, um, some of them just don't work. Okay. And also, uh, you know, it's, it's like with buying songs for 99 cents. You know, convenience uh, beats free. Um, you know, if you go, I, I, per I personally use a site called SSLs.com, and I, I don't have any commercial affiliation with them, but their user interface is, is really nice, and it's really easy, and they offer it for less than $10 a year, and they say, oh, you ask, well, what, what server are you running? You know, I'm running Apache X dot Y, and it gives you, you know, screenshots. Do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. You can't possibly get it wrong, you know? So, yeah, okay, maybe I could save 10, ten bucks a year, but I think for most people, you know, it, it's, it's, it's probably cheaper in the long run to pay for it, yeah. What do you think about the uh, browsers warn you when uh, you have a self-signed certificate, but they don't warn you when you're running an unencrypted connection? Yeah, well, um... <sighs> So I have good news, which is that a lot of people are quite interested in HTTP2, you know, the next version of HTTP that's coming along, and it's quite a bit faster, lower latency, lower latency and higher throughput. And both Chrome and Firefox have stated that if you want to use HTTP2, you have to use TLS. They're not going to support uh, plain text HTTP2. Now, Safari and IE are saying, oh, I don't know about that. Some of our enterprise customers, you know, want to man in the middle of their employees. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's quite an uh, interesting discussion. So at least I think, the br I, I agree that it is kind of un unfortunate that, the, that uh, what you described, but at least I think the browsers are, are moving in, in, a, in a better direction. Okay, so let's return to this slide where I talked about the privacy levels. And the stuff I was just talking about now, about HTTPS and two-factor and cert pinning and that kind of stuff, is basically designed to give you common privacy. Because don't forget, your data is still sitting unencrypted at Microsoft, at Yahoo, at Google, at uh, Facebook, you know, LinkedIn. And, you know, the, the crooks might hack those guys and the government might hack those guys or come in with a national security letter. And maybe we want more. Maybe we actually want strong privacy. What that means is the data has to be encrypted when it's going over the wire, it has to be encrypted when it's at the rest on the server, and it's only unencrypted when you're actually interacting with it on your screen, on your device. Okay? Is that possible? Absolutely. Is it tricky? Yeah, but it's actually not that hard, and I'll talk about it. Um, uh, but it does carry some costs. Think of it from the point of view of Google. If they ran Gmail end-to-end -end 
encrypted, so it was actually encrypted at rest in the server. First of all, they wouldn't know what the mail was about, so they couldn't show you the best ads for you know what, what, what the mail is about. Well, I could live with that. Um, but uh, it also means they would have a lot harder time fighting spam, you know, because Gmail analytics spam is actually pretty good. And it depends on being able to look at the message and seeing if it's a guy from Nigeria offering you $50 million in gold. And if it's all encrypted, then you know they can't do that. So there are real costs to that. So I think you know it would be safe to conclude that Google would never consider doing a thing like that, except for they are. So Google is pushing this thing called end-to-end, -end, which is going to be a Chrome plugin that uh, uses very solid public key encryption technology to actually do just exactly what I was talking about. So it's all encrypted whenever it's in motion, whenever it's in rest. The only time it's not encrypted is when it's on your screen. Now, the fact that this be is being done with JavaScript creates another whole complex nest of issues that I could easily spend another 45 minutes talking about. But, but still, this is a very interesting and, and, and positive direction. And clearly, you know, this is the kind of thing that Apple was talking about too. You know, if, if Apple and Google are saying this, you know, uh, do you care about your customers less than Apple and Google care about their customers? If you're doing anything that really has a very high impact on people's lives, shouldn't you be considering offering them this level of privacy? Shouldn't you be considering offering encryption at rest all the time? So suppose you want to do that. What do you have to do? Well, the first thing you need to do is learn about something called OpenPGP, which is the basis of almost all the popular, widely deployed public key encryption described by RFC 4880, which actually is not bad. You, know, you can actually read it if you're a computer programmer and make sense out of it. It describes uh, how OpenPGP works, and it assumes that you understand public key, private key encryption. Now, I assume that 75% of the people in this room actually understand the public key concept, so I'm going to ask your forgiveness while I explain the basics to the other 25% of the people in the room, because it's actually not that complicated. The notion of public key, private key encryption is that you have two mathematical objects, just bits, you know, two chunks of bits, and they are linked together, and uh, they are, uh, they're, they're called a private key and a public key. And there are an infinite number available, and your computer can make them, your cell phone can make them. Actually, that little Yubi key I held up can actually make them. It's, it's not, not, not it's, 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 it, it can be done. So anybody can have a public key, private key pair. And due to some really terrific mathematical magic, they have this strong relationship where, you know, you, from knowing the public, you can't find out the private, and they encrypt and decrypt inversely. You encrypt with one, it decrypts with the other, private to public or public to private. And the idea is, you know, you share the public key with the world and you keep the private key very safely locked up and, and never, never share it with anybody. And what that means is you can do these things. If I encrypt, if I find your public key, and who do I know here? I see Adrian there. So if I encrypt something with Adrian's public key and send it to Adrian over ordinary email, Facebook, chat, whatever, then I know that only he can read it because only he has the private key. Okay? Furthermore, if I send something to Adrian, I can also encrypt it with my private key and then Adrian can decrypt it with my public key. So can anybody else who has my public key, which is everybody, but they know that only I could have sent it. And you can do both. You can encrypt it first with my private key, then with his public key, and then only Adrian can read it, and only an I could have sent it. It's pure mathematical magic. It's one of our finest intellectual achievements. You know, every time I look at it, I'm just in awe as to the, the cleverness of it. I'm not going to... And by the way, it, it, that's what HTTPS does. HTTPS is, is based on this technology. I'm not going to take the time to do a deep dive on how this actually works, but there's this great... Uh, website. You can find it by typing the first few milliseconds of an HTTPS connection. And he actually goes into detail about exactly what happens and what messages go back and forth and what the math is and how it all works. And anybody who's even slightly geeky, I think, will find this really cool, finding what, what really actually truly happens when HTTPS gets going. So the whole notion is we have private keys and public keys and we have encrypted messages. Now, I noticed that computer programmers are not that crazy about ex abstractions, so I thought I'd show you one. There's what a public key looks like. Uh, there's a native binary format, but that's really awkward to transmit over the internet. So almost always they get transmitted around in this ASCII format. And if you actually use one to encrypt a message, there's what the message looks like. And so you say, well, okay, maybe I want to do this. What software do I need? So it turns out there's actually quite a bit of software out there, and, and most of it is pretty good. Probably sort of the 
Ur software, the basic software that came first and everything else has reference to, is identified right there in that comment, which is uh, GNU PG, the GNU Privacy Guardian. And this is a very big, substantial, uh, comprehensive suite of crypto software. Uh, it's a great big glob of C++, um, and it's been around for a long time. And it works. It's very reliable, very widely trusted in the industry. And uh, on Mac and uh, Windows and uh, Linux uh, flavored systems. Um, it has a very decent command line tool. If you like command lines, it's you know GPG encrypt, GPG decrypt, GPG list, things like that. Um, of course, civilians, ordinary people who aren't geeks will never use a command line tool. Um, it also has a, uh, a GUI in both in all those cases, which is okay. You know. Not bad, but still really not, not suitable for civilians, I wouldn't say. But you know, that's not their fault. It's bloody Apple and Microsoft and the you know, Debian and Ubuntu and so on core team should just be putting nice GUIs on this and putting it right into the system. It's, uh, these guys have provided good low-level libraries. Their job is done. Um, but you know, even if you're not running at that low level, if you're building apps in Rails, for example, there's an open PGP gem. You know, nice, simple calls, like here's a message, here's a key, encrypt it. Easy to understand. Um, if you're in Python, now I'm not actually a connoisseur of the Python ecosystem, but I typed you know, Python GNU PG and that was the first result that came up. I assume it's probably good. Um, in the Node ecosystem, um, there's a, a good implementation, seems to be quite well regarded. If you're in Go, the Google language, there's a, a nice clean implementation of OpenPGP. So in most of the ecosystems where you want to live, um, it's actually pretty straightforward to, to do this. The APIs are there and they work. And then we come to Java. And in Java, we have this thing called Bouncy Castle, which is a very huge, very large, old suite of software, uh, which does everything you could ever possibly want to do with cryptography. And its API is written by Nazis from hell. You know, it, 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 it's, it's the worst kind of Java factory, 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 factory stuff that you can possibly imagine. And there would never be such a thing as a simple call. Here's a message, here's the key, please, and please decrypt it. No, they couldn't do that, you know. First you all have to the factory to make the factory, and then the thing to call the thing to open the stream, and the other thing to observe the stream. And, the <laughs> and, and in this pr particular project I'm working on that I'll show you, there's like this chunk of Java code with 34 classes and 10,000 lines that provides a layer on top of Bouncy Castle so that you actually have an API you can use. Um, so, you know, I, we've got, probably got some pretty good Java hackers in the crowd here. You know, if somebody wanted to do a real public service, it would be to make a sort of a standardized layer on top of Bouncy Castle so that, uh, you know, ordinary mere mortal programmers could actually use it. The other bad news is that Bouncy Castle is apparently, near as I can tell, the best option in .NET as well. So, anyhow. So let's assume you've bought into this. You're going to have your data encrypted at rest. You're going to offer strong privacy to your users. So what are you going to have to do? For this to work, um, you have to do all these steps. Um, now, getting keys and storing them is actually not so hard. You know, there's, there's reasonably good, go the code is there, it's been there for years, it's really easy, it's like one system call, basically, one, one API call, make a key. And you have to collect a few pieces of information from the user, but I've seen lots of good user interfaces for this, so that's actually not hard. Um, and then moving them around, people, people who are privacy bigots, who thought privacy was a zero or one switch, used to be totally paranoid about private keys. Oh, you must never send your private key over the network. It always must be on a quantum crypto device with titanium walls three feet thick and so on. Well, you know, one thing about private keys is they're always protected by a pass passphrase. And the consequences of somebody actually having your private key are, you know, not that terrible, actually. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's pretty safe. I personally move my, my, my public private p key pairs around by putting them in Dropbox. Yeah, I suppose Dropbox could be hacked, but you know, so what? It, it doesn't seem like that big a risk profile to me. Um, and of course, then you need good tools to encrypt and sign the message and to decrypt them, and I'll actually show you one of those in a little bit. Um, it's, it's not actually terrible at all. That's not a real huge graphical user interface challenge, which leaves this one. And weirdly enough, this has sort of been the big stumbling block, the single biggest stumbling block that has pre prevented the widespread ad adoption of strong crypto. You know, I want to send something to Adrian. How do I find Adrian's public key? Um, 
you know, when Ed Snowden first uh, surfaced, he sent an email to Glenn Greenwald saying, you know, what's your public key? And, and Glenn Greenwald said, what? What's one of those? Um, uh, and so the original theory of the people who built this software was that the way we would learn to find public keys was a thing called the web of trust. So you could actually get together physically with somebody and they would do a thing on their, on their keypad that would sign your public key. And you know, if, y if, if you knew me and I, I get together with Adrian and Adrian shows me his key and I believe it's Adrian, I sign his key. And then somebody who wants Adrian's key can get this thing and they see it signed by me. They don't know Adrian but they know me and they say, okay, well, you know, is signed, so I'll trust it. And this was called the web of trust, and the idea is we would have key signing parties, and we would all get, get together and drink beer and sign each other's keys. I don't know. It, it, you know, it, it didn't work, okay? You know, the web of trust was a superficially plausible idea, maybe. But anyhow, it, it didn't work. It has signally failed, and key discovery by this process doesn't work. The beer drinking worked pretty well, right? <laughs> um, so what actually got me is slipping down the slippery slope of crypto and privacy is I ran across this thing called Keybase.io uh, the day I was leaving Google. And I'm not sure that Keybase.io as the site is the right solution, but the type of technology that they are building is. So you can go to a place called Keybase.io slash Timbray, and it tells you there's a public key there you can retrieve, and it's got you know this hex fingerprint. And um, it doesn't say who it's for. It just says it's named Timbray, but it also says there is proof that this public key, w the, the private key corresponding to this public key, is controlled by the person who is Timbray on Twitter and Timbray on GitHub and controls the domain name tbray.org. And I could also, you know, make a Reddit identity and a Hacker News identity and so on and so forth. And you don't have to trust Keybase for this to work. You can actually go receive the, tree, the tweet run the decryption and check and make sure that it really was signed with the public key corresponding to that private key. So it's a evidence-based public key directory that you don't have to trust to use, plus it has an extremely sane and well thought through JSON HTTP prof, uh, API and um, uh, an, op an open source uh, licensed uh, command line client built written in Node that you can uh, download and look at. And I think it's a very powerful idea. And frankly, the guys who are building this are the guys who made a, a whole bunch of money on their previous startups. And they're just doing it because they think the world needs something like this. They don't have any business model. They think there might be a business model in signing software releases. But they're just doing it because they think it needs to be done. And I'm working, I've been helping them a little bit too because I think it needs to be done. So we are getting pretty close to the position in history where we can actually put strong crypto in the hands of mere humans who don't ever want to see a hex digit, don't ever want to know what a, what a subkey is, never want to know what a signature is, and have it more or less just work. Um, there's this one particular Android app, which I don't think is the be-all and the end-all, but it's the one I've been working on, called Open Keychain. Um, and if I could broadcast my Android screen, I'd show it to you. But let me just actually, I have a screencast here that um, uh, shows how it works. Now, this might be a little loud, so whoever's watching the audio might want to turn it down. Okay, let's look at some cryptography on Android. We'll use the Open Keychain app, which keeps uh, crypto keys, and at the moment it's only got one in it. For this fake account, I've made the Go to Denmark Demo Bunny. And if we're going to use that to send an encrypted message to me, Tim Bray, we're going to need to find my key. So let's add a key and search the cloud for Tim Bray. Now you'll notice that since it's hooked up to my uh, Android contacts, it's pretty easy to find things. You don't have to do too much typing. So it'll go out in parallel and search keybase.io and the uh, open PGP servers, and it finds three keys for Tim Bray. One's for somebody else down there at the bottom, one's been revoked, and one is a current public uh, key for me. So let's import that. And that worked, and now that's part of my keychain. Okay, so let's send a message. Let's switch over to Google Keep, where I've got a little message, Crypto Love from Denmark, and I will encrypt that with using the standard Android share mechanisms, sharing it to encrypt with open keychain. And it'll want to know who do I encrypt it for, and that'll be me. And uh, who signs it, so we'll sign that with the go to Domo Bunny account. And we're ready to go to encrypt and share it. Now, of course, this is the problem. To share it properly, we're going to have to use a passphrase, which is horrible on any mobile device. And as a result, I picked something absurdly easy, which is sort of defeating the purpose. 
Okay, so I typed in the passphrase, it extracts the key, it encrypts it, and it says, okay, you've got an encrypted message. Who do you want, how do you want to share it? Well, we'll share it with Gmail. It gets the two line correct, so we'll just type in a subject. And send that message off on its way. Okay. Now, fortunately, there is a solution to that uh, password for the key phrase for the passphrase for this private key problem. All right. Here we are in Gmail, and here's the secret message that Demo Bunny sent over to me. Now, there's an irritating shortcoming in Gmail, which is you can't just click on a message and say share that message. So I've actually selected the body of the message. And let's be fair, there's also a bug in Open Keychain at the moment where in this particular set of circumstances I just can't share to decrypt. But let's copy the message, let's switch over to Open Keychain, and let's say decrypt. So we can just de decrypt from the clipboard. Now remember when we sent this message, uh, we had to use private, uh, Demo Bunny's private key to sign it, and that meant typing Demo Bunny's passphrase into the mobile, which was tremendously painful. And similarly, to decrypt it using my private key, we would have to use my passphrase to do that. And my passphrase, since it's a real private key, is long, complicated, and cryptographically strong, and would be insanely difficult to type in. So let's not do that. We've got it set up here. So let's say decrypt from clipboard, and it says, hold your key against the back of the device. And there you go. It worked. You decrypted it. It uh, told you that it was signed by Demo Bunny. And there's the message. Crypto love from Denmark. Okay, so at the end of the keynote, I closed with a, with a picture of a forest, and, and people seem to like that. So let's go back to the forest. Here, here's a different picture of a different forest. Um, and it's beautiful. I, you know, I'm Canadian. I like this stuff. I spend as much time as I can in the forest. But, you know, the forest is kind of a dangerous place, particularly at you know, 50 degrees of north latitude where we are. And you, know, you wouldn't go out there without being prepared with appropriate clothing and footwear and things to eat and all the appropriate preparation for being out in the wilderness. The Internet's a dangerous place too. You know, why on earth would you send your customers' data out on the Internet for storage and transmission without the appropriate protection and preparation? And increasingly, that means good practices for basic TLS everywhere, HTTPS, and if you're really taking these things seriously, and why wouldn't you take it seriously? Encryption everywhere. And we're getting pretty close to the point where that can be done smoothly, easily, and start getting ready for it now, because I kind of suspect in a small number of years, this isn't going to be an optional choice. It's something you're going to have to do to be taken seriously. So why don't you go out and be leaders instead of followers and start working on it now? So thank you. That's all. <laughs>